And so I'd like to close with the following th thing, which is um, just for everybody, because things are just are moving. Uh, like I think our monkey brains can only process so much. Uh, to remember what the world was like when we started the program. Okay, or what's happened since we started the program. So since we started the program, when we started the program, uh, President Obama was still in office. <laughs> and in the final two quarters of his presidency, the White House released four reports on artificial intelligence and its implication for the US economy. So four reports. To my knowledge, there's no other area of technology where the White House has released four reports in two quarters. Okay, then uh, we rolled into the, new, into the new administration. And in May, uh, Google announced that they were changing their strategy from mobile first to AI first. And some people just say, well, okay, what does that really mean? Is that just a marketing thing because AI is like pixie dust and everyone wants to spread it on stuff because it seems to be more valuable when you do. But AI first actually means something. And what it means is that the company puts prediction accuracy as its foremost goal at the expense of everything else. So in other words, they reallocate resources and they set as a priority prediction accuracy, even if it means we lose some revenues, we lose some customers, we lose this, we lose this, we lose this, because prediction accuracy is going to be our guiding compass, our North Star. Maximize prediction accuracy. Our AIs are our single most valuable asset. And then a handful of other companies quickly followed suit. That was in May. Then in July, the Chinese government announced their AI strategy, that by 2020, they would have caught up on a number of dimensions uh, to the, the world leaders. In 2025, they will be a leader in some subsets of AI. And by 2030, they would rule the world uh, in terms of uh, AI. And one city, Tianjin, just one city, com has committed $5 billion. And in Chinese style, uh, 20 square kilometers of what they call intelligent industry zone. Okay, one city. So we had a lot of uh, fanfare in this country when we committed a couple hundred million bucks. Five billion, one city outside of Beijing. Okay, that was July. That was on July 20th was when that came out. Then just as we were, you know, uh, kind of winding up for the Labor Day weekend, stocking the fridge with cold ones, uh, President Putin, Friday, September 1, addressing a group of students. What did he say? He said, AI is the future, not just for Russia, but for all mankind, all humankind. And then he wrapped up his speech by saying, whichever country wins in AI will rule the world. Okay, that wasn't an AI professor at some university. That was the president of Russia. Last week in Toronto, we hosted a group of economists to uh, work on what does this mean for, for society. And so this, that, uh, this meeting last week, it was at the Intercontinental on Bloor Street, was we sent out invitations about four months prior. We invited a handful of the top economists in the world. We didn't think they'd come. We thought maybe one or two would come, because a lot of them aren't working in AI. They're working on trade, international trade. They're working on tax. They're working on economic growth. So each one, we said, hey, you're the world leader in economics of international trade. Would you consider doing a paper with this other person who's also an, an expert in international trade? And the two of you do it, but what does AI mean for trade? And you, you, and you, you are the top economists in the world on growth. Would you do what a paper on, on AI and growth? Now, AI, like it's in, infiltrated our circles, but over in economics land, uh, they weren't thinking about it, most of them, with a couple of sex exceptions. Hal Varian uh, at Google, Susan Athey at Microsoft, Eric Brynjolfsson at MIT. The rest, not thinking about it. But to our amazement, we thought one or two would say yes, they virtually all said yes. So last week in downtown Toronto, 
We had two Nobel Prize winners. We had four former chairs of the US President's Council of Economic Advisors. We had five chief economists, chief economists of the World Bank, chief economists Google, Microsoft, and so on, uh, chief economists of the Israeli Neset, a former treasure, Treasury Secretary, Larry Summers, and they were all sitting in a room focused on what does AI mean for the world economy. And I was stunned that they all actually took it really seriously. Like they all said, this is really a thing. And we don't have economic models that know how to handle this. Susan Athey made this incredible point, which is, under what conditions will AI be like the 2008 financial crisis? So the thing that we missed in the 2008 financial crisis was that housing markets are correlated. That was sort of essentially the problem. So we assumed that Kansas City was a completely distinct market from Florida. And then when that assumption was wrong, it led to a whole series of events, and you know what happened. And Susan Acey's thesis was, if we get autonomous vehicles and it just wipes out, let's say, the trucking industry, it's about three to four million, dollar, three to four million jobs. If that happens over a five to 10 year period, we won't even notice it. Like we churn and we get to create about a little over four million jobs a year and we lose, you know, four, we gain 4.5 million, we lose 4.2 million, it'll just get lost in the, in the churn. We won't even feel it. And at a macro level, you're, if you're a truck driver, you'll feel it. But a regular people, you know, you won't feel it. Nobody in this room will feel it. But her point was, what if that happens to 12 or 15 industries at a time? Like what if it hits them all at the same time? Because right now, we don't think of unemployment as being correlated across markets. Now, her thesis was that if the, the gating item to creating autonomous vehicles is different than the gating item for, say, material handlers, because what's the gating item is the complementary factors. Like, the complementary factors to autonomous driving are the, the physical robotic cars or the highway system they drive on if, or the regulation. If those are the gaining items, no problem. They're gonna, these things are going to unfold over time. And we'll have, we'll have time to adapt and adjust what economists call adjustment costs in the labor market. But if the gaining item is a general purpose technology that we call AI, such that it, it, we cross some threshold of capability that affects all industries or a whole bunch of industries at the same time, that there could be a labor market crisis the likes of which we've never seen. So what I just would like you to think about as we conclude year one of Next AI is that, you know, I find this. Like when I look out the window and I look at just sort of the city and it's just, you know, chugging along like it did yesterday and the year before and the year before that, it all looks the same. And then you think about the kind of stuff people are saying. When you listen to Deepnify, and they are struggling to get their, you know, they're telling you how their, you know, their chief scientist has won these competitions on Kaggle and yada, yada, and all this stuff. And they're trying to solve, like, yogurt shrinkage for Loblaws, and they can't get the thing integrated because there's a whole bunch of barriers to just integrating a yogurt shrinkage AI for Loblaws. And why are we worried about, you know, Russia and whoever wins AI wins the world? Like, the juxtaposition of the apps, the applications we saw on the stage, so early, so raw, like just trying to get their first customers. And on the other hand, you have President Putin saying, oh, this, whoever wins this is going to win the world. It's very hard to keep both of those thoughts in your head at the same time. It's like cognitive dissonance. So the thing I ask you just to, to leave with is that, in my view, what you saw today, and for those of you who are in the first year of Next AI, and you know, part of it you enjoyed, part of it felt very frustrating, is that this is what it feels like to be on the frontier. Like, this is what it feels like. It feels like cognitive dissonance, because on the one hand, the world is still in yesterday. And on the other hand, you're working on the assumption of what the world will feel like tomorrow. And we, all of us sitting in this room right now, are stuck in the middle. We are stuck in the middle with dealing with all the, just the new, the, all the gritty frictions associated with trying to get a yogurt shrinkage application to work in Loblaws, and on the other hand, listening to President Putin saying whoever wins this wins the world. Thanks for being with us for the first year. <laughs>